Section 28 of The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. The Peril of the Fairies. It is something to have heard once in a lifetime the ecstatic thrill that glorifies Essex Hall while that intellectual pirate, Mr. Bernard Shaw, sails out and scuttles a number of little merchant ships of thought that have never hurt anybody. The applause and admiring laughter that punctuate his periods really suggest that Fabianism makes people happy, while the continued prosperity of the group gives the lie to the cynic who reminded me how popular ping-pong was while the craze lasted, and how utterly forgotten it is to-day but I had to rub my eyes while I stood in the overcrowded room, listening to Puck and Jaeger, more witty perhaps than the old Puck, but no less boyishly malicious, and ask myself whether, after all, this was only the old magic in a new form. True, civilization had perforce made him larger, in order that human beings might appreciate his eloquence, and I saw no traces of wings or magic flowers. But beyond that I recognized the same pity and contempt for mortals, the same arrogant confession of his own faults, the same naive cunning. And then, perhaps a turn of the voice did it, or some slight slurring of the words, the enchantment passed, the ears of his audience resumed their ordinary dimensions, and I offered mentally two teaspoonfuls of honey to the real Puck, for I saw that he had tricked me into recognizing his qualities in the most serious man the twentieth century knows. Yet, though I found Mr. Shaw to be only a prophet, and his fellow Fabians honest enthusiasts instead of bewitched weavers, I cannot say that the discovery left my mind at ease for the welfare of the fairy kingdom that is so important to every one who has not forgotten it. What if this terrible seriousness were to spread? What if every one were to turn prophet? What if a night should come when never a child in all the Duke of York's theatre would clap its hands to keep Tinkerbell alive? At first I wished to reject this frightful end of all our play and laughter and wonder as impossible. Yet sinister stories of children who preferred sewing-machines and working models to dolls and tin soldiers rose in my mind, and it is hardly more than a step from that degree of progress to the case of the child who may find the science of sanitation more interesting than tales of fairies. The possibility should make even the extremists shudder, but it must be remembered that many honest people believe in technical education, and that for that matter practically the whole of the teaching in our schools takes the form of an attack on the stronghold of the imaginative child. It is our barbarous custom to supplant a child's really beautiful theories with the ugly crudities which we call facts, and it is impossible to realize how much humanity loses in the process. As for the fairies, frail little folk at best, how shall they prevail against the criticism of our sulphur and the cunning of our permanganate of potash? Shall we always be able to distinguish them from microbes? It may be well to pause here and see whither the wise, serious men of today are taking us. I suppose they will abolish Will-o'-the-Wisp by draining all the marshes, and their extreme industry will render Puck's kindly household labors ludicrously unnecessary. They will turn their swords against all the bad barons, unjust kings, and spiteful magicians, whose punishment has been hitherto the fairy's special task and this they will do in black-leg fashion, neither demanding nor receiving their just wages of beauty and immortality. They will scornfully set aside the law, so dear to the younger inhabitants of nurseries, by which it is always the youngest son or the youngest daughter whom the gods delight to honour. They will fill with porridge and deck with flannel underclothing the little flower-girls and crossing-sweepers, whose triumphs set faith in the eyes of babes, with their hard, cruel facts, they will completely wreck the fairy civilization which has taken centuries of dreaming and wandering children to construct. They will brush our fancies away like cobwebs. A while ago, when I was a little boy, some enemy seeing me admire the stars thought it necessary to tell me exactly what they were. Later, my natural interest in the extraordinary behavior of the sea led another enemy to place a globe in my hands. 
and prick the bubble of the universe with ridiculous explanations. So it is that, when I regard the heavens, I see enormous balls of rotten chemicals, rendered contemptibly small by distance, floating in a thin fluid called space. So it is that, when I look at the sea, my mind is occupied with stupid problems about the root of floating bamboos, when I ought to be exalted as one who peers out through the darkness towards the unknown. Where there were two, then, there are to-day twenty kindly persons about every child, eager to prove the things it would like to believe in superstitions, and eager to explain away its miracles in terms of dust-carts and vegetable soup. Our babies are taught to hang out their stockings, and to batter in their empty eggshells, but are reminded at the same moment that these charming rituals are but follies, and that the capital of Scotland is Edinburgh. Youngsters babble imperialism and socialism when they ought to be standing on their heads to look at the antipodes, and their parents commend their common sense. Already, I fear, the wings of many of the fairies are beginning to fade, and Puck capers but mournfully in his lonely haunts. But fairies, goblins, elves, call them what you will, they are worth having, and that is why I would entreat the wise men who are arranging to-morrow for us to spare them, even though they have forgotten themselves all that the presence of fairies in the world is worth. By all means, feed the children and give them union jacks, but let their faith in the beautiful be looked to as well. And finally, to the serious person who says with raised eyebrows, you can't honestly say you believe in fairies, I would answer this. In a world which at present is fiercely antagonistic to the belief in any emotion less material than hunger, it is impossible to avoid occasional doubt concerning the existence of anything which it is not possible to eat. But when I am in the company of those who really do believe, I do not fail to hear the echoes of fairy laughter in their speech, and see the flicker of fairy wings reflected in their eyes, and with this knowledge I am content. This is the end of section 28. Section 29. The Day Before Yesterday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Day Before Yesterday by Richard Middleton. Drury Lane and the Children. We have noticed that in writing about pantomimes, the critics of our contemporaries usually make two rather serious mistakes. The first is the assumption that pantomime is really intended for the amusement of children, and the second, which to a certain extent is implicit in the first, is the conclusion that most pantomimes are unsatisfactory because they fail to provide their children with suitable fear. A glance at any pantomime audience should dispel the first illusion. Even at matinees the children are in the minority, while at night the disproportion is quite startling. To us it seems that the real purpose of modern pantomime is to give conscientious objectors to music halls an opportunity of witnessing a music hall entertainment without shame. It follows that, even if the second criticism were just, it would not be very important. But though we agree that the average pantomime is far removed from the ideal entertainment for children, it is as all events quite harmless and contains a number of elements that children like. They appreciate the color of the pageant, the papier-mâché treasures, the gilt moons and ultramarine sunsets, the jeweled and gilt scenery. They like the funny clothes and red noses and boisterous horseplay of the low comedians. They like the little girls in short skirts, in whom the sophisticated recognize the tired ladies of the ballet. They like, in fact, nearly all the things which writers with sentimental views on children think it necessary to condemn. As a general rule, they do not care for the love-making or the singing. After a long experience of pantomimes, we are prepared to say that they are right, though our reasons are not perhaps theirs. The singing in pantomimes is nearly always extremely bad, and the fact that the principal boy is always the principal girl makes the love scenes ridiculous. The wonder is that in an entertainment that must at all costs be made attractive to adults, there should be so much that gives genuine pleasure to young people. From the days of our youth we have always had a kindness for Drury Lane Theatre, and, above all, for Drury Lane Pantomime. 
The theater has an individual atmosphere. The pantomime is not like the pantomime one sees anywhere else. In order to appreciate the size of the place, it is necessary to put on a very small pair of knickerbockers and gaze upwards from the stalls between the chocolates and the ices. It is like looking into the deeps of heaven, though here the gods suck oranges and make catcalls, those fascinating sounds that our youthful lips would never achieve. Drury Lane is the only theatre that preserves the old glamour. We never enter its doors without thinking of Charles Lamb, and it would hardly astonish us if Mistress Nell Gwynn came to greet us with her basket of china oranges, wearing that famous pair of thick worsted stockings that the little link boy gave her to save her pretty feet from the chilblains. Outside, the image of Shakespeare leans on its pedestal, sadly contemplative of the grey roofs of Covent Garden. The porters who carry about bunches of bananas unconsciously reproduce the pictures of Mr. Frank Brangwen. If Shakespeare ever slips down from his perch to watch a scene or two of the pantomime from the shadows of the auditorium, he must wonder a little at our twentieth-century masks. Like the children, he would probably appreciate the splendid color and brightness of the spectacle, and, having been an actor himself, he would perhaps pardon the actor's cheerful neglect of the rights of the dramatist. For modern pantomime is a business of strongly contrasted individualities, rather than the product of blended and related effort. This is especially true of Drury Lane, whose stage at this season of the year is always crowded with vaudeville Napoleons and musical comedy Cleopatras. In detail, the pantomime is excellent. As an artistic entity, it does not exist. At first sight, this seems rather a pity. Given a wonderfully appointed stage, gorgeous mounting, a fine orchestra, and a number of gifted performers, it is natural to expect that the result should be more than the mere sum of these units. But, as a matter of fact, the pantomime is essentially formless. Those critics who clamor for straightforward versions of the old nursery stories would be vastly disappointed if they got what they wanted. The old stories are well enough when told by firelight in the nursery after tea of a winter's evening, but they lack humor and are not, as a rule, dramatic. Bluebeard, of course, is a striking exception. When a story lasting twenty minutes must be expanded to last four hours, the story is bound to suffer. When, in addition, all the characters are played by performers whose strength lies in their individuality, it will be surprising if any part of the illusion created by the original fable survives at all. End of section 29section number 30 of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april 60090 california united states of america the day before yesterday by richard middleton children's drama at a season of the year when children invade both the stage and the auditorium of many theatres in unwanted numbers it would be at least topical to speculate as to the philosophy of pantomime and the artistic merits and effects of child actors and actresses but while juvenile mimicry of adult conceptions of drama is entertaining enough it is more to our purpose to consider the dramatic spirit as it is actually present in children themselves pantomimes certainly do not reflect this spirit and in spite of the sentimental but hardly more childish influence of fairy plays are still aimed exclusively at adult audiences who grant themselves no other opportunity of appreciating the humors of the music halls probably the ideal children's play would have the color of pantomime the atmosphere of peter pan the poetry of the bluebird and most important of all a downright melodramatic plot it is the last that is invariably lacking in entertainments nominally provided for children it is the first consideration in the entertainments they provide for themselves if grown-up people were in the habit which unfortunately they are not of meeting together in moments of relaxation and acting little extemporary plays these plays would surely give a first-hand indication of the dramatic situations that interested them yet this is what children are always doing and in terms of play every little boy is a dashing and manly actor and every little girl a beautiful and accomplished actress from the first glad hour when little brother cries to little sister 
You be Red Riding Hood, and I'll be the wolf and eat you. The dramatic aspect of life is never absent from the mind of imaginative youth. In one respect, at all events, these play dramas of children should meet with the approval of modern dramatic critics. No one can accuse them of losing sight of the motive of their drama in elaboration of scenery or stage effects. A chair will serve for a beleaguered castle, a pirate ship, or Cinderella's coach in turn, and the costumes imitate this Elizabethan simplicity. Nevertheless, it cannot be said that their stage is entirely free from the tyranny of those pernicious conventions that place obstacles in the way of art. The law of primogeniture, always rigidly enforced in nurseries, as Mr. Kenneth Graham has observed, makes the eldest brother as much of a nuisance as the actor-manager. According to his nature and the character of the play, he always insists on being either hero or villain, and in the absence of limelight contrives to give himself an exaggerated share both of the action and of the dialogue. Sisters are placid creatures, and do not very much mind whether they have anything to do or not as long as they can all be princesses. But it is hard on a younger brother to be compelled to walk the plank, although he has the heart of a pirate chief. And the fact that whatever part he may play, the eldest brother must triumph at the end of the last act tends to stereotype the lines along which the drama develops. As for the plays themselves, it must be owned that they cover an extraordinary extent of ground, and display a variety that no other repertory theatre can hope to equal. The present writer has seen five children in one afternoon give spirited performances of Aladdin, David and Goliath, an unnamed drama of pirates, and the famous comedy of teacher and naughty pupils. This last is the standard performance of elementary school girls all over London, and to the discerning critic displays just those faults of sophistication and over-elaboration to which long runs at our theatres have made us accustomed. The teacher is always too monotonously ill-tempered. The pupils are ill-behaved beyond all discretion. Ibsen, one feels, would have expressed this eternal warfare between youth and authority in subtler terms. Sometimes, however, London children achieve a really startling realism in their games, and the looker-on may derive a considerable knowledge of the mothers from watching the children perform, in some such drama of life as the ever-popular Shopping on a Saturday Night. It may be noted here that the children's is rhapsodies over dolls and kittens, or, indeed, over anything, are always clever pieces of character acting. Naturally, children do not rhapsodize, but they soon learn the secret of the art from observation of their elders. But though in large towns the poorer children may not have escaped the spirit of the age, so that their art hardly raises them from the gray levels of their lives, children in general are eager to find the artistic symbol for their dreams, and allow realism but an accidental share in the expression of their romantic ideals. They do not seek the materials for their dramas in the little comedies and tragedies of nursery or schoolroom life. They prefer to forget that ordinary everyday happenings have ever wooed them to tributary laughters or tears, and fulfill their destiny as pirates or highwaymen, fairies or forlorn princesses. Probably the nearest approach to children's drama that we have on the modern stage is the so-called cloak and sword drama. Children's plays are full of action. Speeches are short and emphatic, and attempts at character acting are desultory and provocative of laughter in the other members of the company. The fights are always carried out with spirit and enthusiasm. To have seen Captain Sharp, that incardine pirate, wiping his sword on his pinafore is to have realized that beauty of violence for which Mr. Chesterton pleads so eloquently in the Napoleon of Notting Hill. Bearing in mind the nature of the dramas that children play to please themselves, it should be possible to lay down certain rules as to the composition of plays for their entertainment. Working by light of Stevenson's lantern, Mr. Barry has done good work in Peter Pan, but he has made tremendous mistakes. The scene on the pirate ship is perfect, a model of what such a scene should be, with plenty of fighting and no burdensome excess of talk. But in a play that is essentially a boy's play, Windy is a mistake. There was no Windy on Stevenson's Island of Treasure, and her continual intrusion into the story would not be tolerated in any nursery. In real life, she would either have to discard her sex 
and become a member of the band or else have adopted the honorary role of princess and stayed tactfully in the background the pirate chief is very good so good in fact and it looks very like an eldest brother's part in which case he would have beaten peter and made him walk the plank the end though pleasing to adult minds is impossible from a childish point of view the boys would never have left their fun of their own free will the gong ought to have sounded for tea or perhaps mr darling could have returned from the city with some mysterious parcels for the children to open that is how things really happen to our mind as we have said above the greatest fault a play for children can have is the lack of a straightforward plot that allows of plenty of stirring and adventurous action children love stories whether they be make-up stories of their own or real stories told them by someone else the hero of the play should be the biggest boy acting it the female characters should have no greater share of the action than the most rudimentary sense of politeness would allow them but they may sit in the background mute but beautiful princesses as much as they like and they are permitted to comment on the courage of the hero when occasion offers successful scenes should be repeated three or four times till their possibilities had been exhausted every now and then if realism is desired nurse or governess should look through the door and say children don't be rough to which the whole company must reply we're only playing once at least in the course of the play one of the smaller members of the company should be smitten into tears to be comforted by the princesses the actors should quarrel freely among themselves and throw up their parts every half hour but on the whole they should all enjoy themselves enormously such an entertainment we admit would be intolerable to the sentimental adult but the criticisms of the children in the audience would be worth hearing end of section thirty section thirty one of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by annie hill the day before yesterday by richard middleton section thirty one childhood in retrospect in age to wish for youth is full as vain as for a youth to turn a child again then um, it is to be supposed that there are few men and women who do not occasionally look back on the days of their childhood with regret the responsibilities of age are sometimes so pressing its duty so irksome that the most contented mind must travel back with envy to a period when responsibilities were not and duties were merely the simple rules of a pleasing game the due keeping of which was sure to entail proportionate reward and this being so and the delights of the golden age always being kept in the back of our mind as a favourable contrast to the present state of things it is hardly surprising that in course of time the memory of the earlier days of our life is apt to become gilded and resplendent and very unlike the simple up and down april existence that was really ours the dull wet days the lessons and the tears are all forgotten it is the sunshine and the laughter and the play that remain but it by no means follows that such hoarding up of pleasant memories tends to make a man discontented with his lot it would rather seem that they impart something of their good humour to the mind in which they are stored so that the sunshine of former jolly days returns to yield an aftermath of more sober joy and to help to light out our later years with a becoming glow of cheerfulness and on the other hand you will find that an habitually discontented man will be quite unwilling to own that the days of his youth at all events were happy there is no doubt that the most natural result of this glorification of our own childhood is a liking for children seeing them naughty or good at work or at play our minds straightway step back through the span of years to greet a little one who behaved in just such a way and the sympathetic understanding thus engendered shows us the surest way both to manage children of our own and to make friends with those of others it is impossible to conceive a man bearing his own childhood in mind behaving unjustly or unkindly to a child 
for seeing that we perceive in every child a more or less distinct reflection of our own child nature such conduct would be something suicidal how much of the child is still contained within our mature mind is difficult to judge some people have much more than others and it is these people who can peel off their experience and knowledge like an athlete stripping for a race and who can step out to play not only with the same spirit and excitement but even with the same mental processes as a child these are they who can readily obtain admission into the sacred circle of child's games and who can fancy for just as long as the game lasts that they are once more wandering in that fairy garden from whose easy paths of laughter and innocence our aching feet are banished for ever here then is the cure for this nostalgia of childhood which seizes the best of us from time to time and causes us to batter vainly at fast locked nursery doors or to look sadly at the gaudy toy shops robbed by the cynical years of their fit halo when this melancholy falls on us and we who are respectable forty feel like senile eighty let us forthwith seek the company of little children and so elude the fatal black dog sophocles did not blush to play with children why should we and for those who are not fortunate enough to number in their acquaintance children of the right age and humour here as the cookery books say is a tried recipe take a copy of mr barry's little white bird together with a large bag of sweets and sally to the park the rest depends on your address but for a shy man a puppy will prove an invaluable aid to the making of acquaintances and if as has happened to ourselves at the end of a delightful afternoon a little lady of some seven years should abjuring words fling her arms around your neck and press an uncommonly sticky pair of lips on your cheek which till that moment we will suppose better acquainted with the razor why then if not sooner you will have learnt the whole philosophy of growing old is the increasing pleasure you can take in the society of the young this once determined a vista of most charming days lies before you and sorrow for a nursery cupboard that has gone into the ewig kit will be forgotten in helping some diminutive neighbour to explore hers southey was really stating this idea when he wrote in the doctor that a house is never perfectly furnished for enjoyment unless there is a child in it rising three years or a kitten rising six weeks though to our mind the presence of both would be the ideal arrangement since the kitten would take the place of the puppy previously mentioned for the child to play with if we wish to support age kindly it is only to be done by surrounding ourselves with youth and the laughter of children, surely the purest and sweetest of all music, will strike a responsive chord in our breasts, and will enable us to live through the years that wither in all harmony and contentment. End of section 31section 32 of the day before yesterday this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org recorded by Annie Hill the day before yesterday by Richard Middleton section 32 the folly of education of all the intellectual exercises with which we solace the idle hours that we devote to thought none is more engaging and at the same time perplexing than that of endeavouring to form a clear conception of the age in which we live naturally the difficulty lies not in lack of materials on which to base an impression indeed we are embarrassed by the quantity of evidence that accumulates to our hand but in the fact that it is hard to see things in true perspective when they are very near to the observer the yet unborn historians of the present era will doubtless lack much of our knowledge but they will be able to unravel in the quietude of their studies the tangled threads and stubborn knots that writhe beneath our fingers with the perpetual changeableness and uneasy animation of life itself 
but if it is impossible to write dispassionately of a revolution while men are dying at the barricades and musket balls are marring the bland uniformity of the wallpaper of the room in which we write it is always open to the student of life to fall back on impressionism the form of art that seeks to bludgeon life with a loaded phrase rather than to woo her to captivity with chosen and honeyed words and the brutal method is apt to prove the more efficacious as with that frail sex that kisses so i am told the masculine hand that grants the accolade of femininity in that blessed state of bruiser and bruised that is nature's highest conception of the relationship of the two sexes while science greets the corpse with incomprehensible formula and the conscientious artist gropes for his notebook of epithets to suit occasions impressionism stops her dainty nose with her diminutive square of perfumed silk and the dog is dead indeed we are all born impressionists and it takes the education of years to eradicate the gift from our natures many people never lose the habit of regarding life in this queer straightforward fashion and go to their graves obstinately convinced that grass is green and the sky is blue in dogged opposition to the scientists didactic dramatists eminent divines philosophers ascetic poets and human beings born blind some of these subtle weavers of argument would have us believe that impressionism means just the converse of the sense in which i am using the word that for instance the fact that grass is green comes to us from indirect sources as that of our own natures we would perceive it to be red or blue but while we believe our impressions to be our own we know that this theory has reached us indirectly so we can well afford to ignore it others again will have it that impressions are not to be trusted and the majority of people while rejecting or failing to comprehend the philosophical basis on which this doubt is founded are only too willing to accept a theory that relieves them in some way of responsibility for their own individual actions as a matter of fact telling a man to mistrust his impressions is like bidding a mariner despise his compass if our senses lie to us we must live perforce in a world of lies but as i hinted above the young are wont to rely on their impressions from the moment when a baby first parts its lips in howling criticism of life children have implicit faith in the evidence of their senses until the grown-up people come along and tell grimy stories of perjured eyes and lying ears and the unhappy fate of the unwise babes who trusted them what is a child to do usually it accepts the new theory of its own inherent blindness and deafness grudgingly but it accepts it nevertheless it begins to rely on the experience of older human beings as if the miracle of its own life were no more than the toneless repetition of other lives that have been before it wonder passes from its life as joy passes from pencil and paper when the little fingers are made to follow certain predestined lines instead of tracing the fancies of the moon the child becomes sensible obedient quick at its lessons it learns the beauty of the world from pictures and the love of its mother from books in course of time its senses become atrophied through disuse and it can in truth no longer see or hear when this stage is reached the education of the individual is completed and all civilization's requirements are satisfied i have described an extreme case the judicious reader will realize that the process is rarely completed in so short a time as the last paragraph suggests but sooner or later most men and women come to believe in experience and to this belief is due our tyrannous treatment of the young i can conceive that an age will come that will shrink with horror from the excesses we commit in the name of education and will regard us who force children to do their lessons against their will very much in the way in which we regard the slave owners of the past only with added indignation that our tyranny is imposed on the children's minds 
and not on the bodies of adults let those conservative readers who find this comparison a little strained reflect for a moment on what it is that we have to teach the next generation with what manner of wisdom we chain the children's imaginations and brand their minds we teach them in the first place to express themselves in sounds that shall be intelligible to us and this i suppose is necessary though i should like to doubt it further we invariably instruct them in the sciences of reading and writing which seems to me frankly unfortunate in utopia as i conceive it the child who thought there was anything worth reading would teach itself to read as many children have done before and in the same way the rarer child who desired to express itself on paper would teach itself to write that any useful purpose is served by the general possession of this knowledge i cannot see even civilization cannot rejoice that her children are able to read the sunday newspapers and scrawl gutter sentiments on the walls of churches beyond this we teach children geography which robs the earth of its charm of unexpectedness and calls beautiful places by ugly names history which chronicles inaccurate accounts of unimportant events in the ears of those who would be better employed in discovering the possibilities of their own age arithmetic which encourages the human mind to set limits to the infinite botany which denotes the purposeless vivisection of flowers chemistry which is no more than an indelicate unveiling of matter and a hundred other so-called arts and science which when examined without prejudice will be found to have for their purpose the standardization and ultimate belittlement of life in utopia the average human being would not know how to read or write would have no knowledge of the past and would know no more about life and the world in general than he had derived from his own impressions the sum of those impressions would be the measure of his wisdom and i think that the chances are that he would be a good deal less ignorant than he is now when his head is full of confused ideas borrowed from other men and only half comprehended i think that our system of education is bad because it challenges the right of the individual to think constructively for himself in rustic families where the father and mother have never learned to read and the children have had the advantages of scholarship the illiterate generation will always be found to have more intelligence than their educated descendants the children were learning french and arithmetic when they should have been learning life and after all this is the only kind of education that counts we all know that a man's knowledge of latin or the use of the globes does not affect his good fellowship or his happiness or even the welfare of the state as a whole what is important is that he should have passed through certain experiences felt certain emotions and dreamed certain dreams that give his personality the stamp of a definite individual existence tomlinson the book made man with his second-hand virtues and second-hand sins is of no use to anyone yet while we all realize this we still continue to have a gentle unreasoning faith in academic education we still hold that a man should temper his own impressions with the experience of others End of section thirty two section thirty three of the day before yesterday this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by annie hill the day before yesterday by richard middleton section thirty three on common sense about this time last year i was fortunate enough to go to a very nice children's party or rather a very nice party for children i add the appreciative epitaph because there was only one grown-up person there and that person was not i and when all is said it may be stated confidently that the fewer the grown-ups the better the children's party nevertheless although there was only one grown-up for about thirty children 
and she the most charming and tactful of girls i had not been long in the place of fairy lamps before i discovered that with one exception i was the youngest person there i had come out that night in the proper party frame of mind my shoes were tight and my mind was full of riddles of which i had forgotten the answers and as i drove along in a four-wheeler whoever went to a party in anything else I noticed that the stars smelt of tangerine oranges. When I reached the house, everything looked all right. The place was very busy, and there were lots of white frocks and collars and pink faces. Yes, it ought to have been a jolly party, but it came about twenty years too late, and the children, I had almost added, were about twenty years too old. Instead of forgetting everything else in the whirl and clamor of play and dancing, they were, it seemed to me, too busy registering the impressions to enjoy themselves. One of them, a child of eleven, was already smitten with a passion for the mot juiced. My tongue, she told me gravely, is like a cloud. And later, a marigold is like a circus. She had a crushing word for a comrade who was looking at herself in a mirror. But you don't really look as nice as you do in the looking-glass. The other children did not seem much better, and I stood forlornly in their midst, as a child stands among the creased trouser legs of its elders, until I saw a scared little face in a corner apart from the rest. "'Why aren't you playing?' I asked. The child looked me straight in the face and burst into a thousand tears. At least here was something young, something not wholly wise. We sat together exchanging grave confidences all evening. Possibly this is a queer way in which to start an article on common sense, but there is more than madness in my method, for I feel assured that the children have derived their new wisdom, a senseless wisdom, a wisdom of facts, from their absurd parents. The latest creed, the belief that comfort for the masses prevents remorse in the individual, may be well enough in its way but it creates a very bad atmosphere in which to bring up children they are taught that life is an agglomeration of facts and no sort of miracle and by learning these facts like little parrots they lose the whole thrill and adventure of life they do not go out to kill dragons because they know that there are no dragons there chivalry survived with children long after common sense had killed it as dead as mutton in the adult mind but now they too have found it out and there are only a few silly poets and mad lovers to keep the memory of quixote green what are these facts by which we are to guide our lives of which indeed our lives are to consist one of the simplest one that has come to have the force of a proverbial expression is the fact that two and two make four and this is one of the first things we teach our children I have a friend who suspects that in moments of intense consciousness, two and two, weary of making four, would make five for a change. I have heard it argued against him by mathematicians that the fourness of four fours, very existence, as it were, depends on its being related to two in the subtle fashion suggested by the well-known dogma. But I can discern no grounds for this assertion. Consider the fate that would befall a man who went for a ride on an omnibus for the purpose of making use of this one fact. He might be aware that the fare to Putney was fourpence, and, proud of his mathematical knowledge, might pay his fare into installments of twopence. What would be his consternation to find that, as he reached his journey's end, he would have to pay another penny, because he had not paid his fourpence in one lump sum? in terms of bus fares two and two do not make four and i would multiply examples of such exceptions to the accepted rule but even if two and two really did make four the fact would remain supremely useless however cunningly it was conveyed the statement would not abate one tear from the sorrows of a child nor would it brighten even for an instant the eyes of a dying man you could not win a girl with it because the man who counts his kisses is damned from the start. A poet could not turn it into song. It would draw no briefest flame from the ashes of a storyteller's fire. The thing is cold, 
inhuman it is made for lawyers and politicians and the persons who argue their lives away on matters of no importance we who are simpler never put two and two together for the purpose of making four for four is of no more use to us than a nice brace of twos the infinite is the answer of all our mathematical problems and if we cannot find it we are quick to sponge the sum off our slates the belief that two and two make four leads most people to think four a better fellow than two two hold for instance that a man with four millions must be richer than a man with two though the groans of our pauper millionaires never cease to admonish our national cupidity two and two make just what your heart can compass neither more nor less and if your unit is worthless they make nothing at all facts are worse than useless for they limit the journeys of the human mind and there is a common sense not founded on facts that represents the extreme limits of our intellectual pilgrimages it is commonly only in this it is true for all humanity when humanity is wise enough to accept it shakespeare had it deliciously and even now we are only beginning to learn the things he knew for instance we are such stuff as dreams are made of and our little life is rounded with a sleep this seems more wisely true to us to-day than it did to the men and women of his age but it was as true when he wrote it as it is now or again men must abide their going hence even as their coming hither ripeness is all this is the true common sense all that we know all that we shall know but this is not the thing that we teach the children in our schools nor is it the light by which most of us guide our lives we invent trivial rules and conventions to belittle the life we have to lead and make marks in the dust with our fingers to cheat an uncheatable fate we add illusion to illusion in coward hopes of outliving the greatest illusion of all we add folly to folly and lie to lie and are content that the result of our labours should be unwisdom and untruth we add two and two and worship the mournful constancy of four i began my article on common sense with a children's party i must end it i suppose somewhere within the limits of our unhoping lives when the night of a hundred kisses draws to a close and dawn with her painted smile creeps like a spy into the room men and women believe that they can see things as they really are the earth is grey to their eyes though not more grey than their own tired flesh and their little hearts are quick to believe that grey is the normal colour of life the sun comes up and tints the world with rose and they forget their sorrow as they have so often forgotten it before and go to their boasting way through the world they believe their own around them in the light that is not the sun's the shadows tremble shadows of the dead shadows of the yet unborn the wise cannot tell them apart end of section thirty three end of the day before yesterday by richard middleton